so much for joining us tonight as we look at Genesis chapter 42. Turn there in your Bibles if you would. Now for those of you who haven't been here before, I want to kind of bring you up to date that uh, Joseph has been sold into slavery in Egypt by his brothers and now he has advanced to being uh, the greatest leader in Egypt under Pharaoh. And Pharaoh has given him a lot of authority and a lot of leadership and responsibility. And I'll tell you what, there's no evidence at all in the Word of God or in history that Joseph ever let God down in any major way. You know, Joseph was uh, a sinner saved by grace just like we are, but most of the time he did live for the Lord. And, and we see that going on even here in these verses. Now, as soon as Joseph was given that kind of authority, he could have instantly gone and captured his brothers who sinned against him and sold him into slavery. He could have captured Mr. and Mrs. Potiphar. Potiphar. <laughs> and so he didn't do that, did he? He, he uh, did God's will. Uh, he didn't have him flogged. He didn't have him thrown in jail. But, but now he's going to get a little even with his brothers now in chapter 42 of the book of Genesis. So let's look at that together. Genesis 42, beginning with verse 1. When Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt, Jacob said to his sons, why do you look at one another? Now I want to stop right there. That's kind of a strange thing for him to say to his boys. There's grain in Egypt. Why do you look at one another? And, and I want you to, to think about what was going on there. Uh, in their minds, in their hearts. See, they had lived with this guilt for so many years. This was 20 years after they had sold Joseph into slavery. And so every day they're wondering when Yahweh was going to punish them, was going to get them back. And so uh, they were just waiting for the hammer to come down. And so when there was a great famine all over the land and it finally came to Canaan, they were getting kind of hungry. They were getting fearful. And so they, they knew, most Bible scholars believe that the, the boys, Joseph's brothers, knew that there was lots of food in Egypt. And people were coming to Egypt to get food who otherwise had no food. And then the thought came to their mind, ding, <laughs> Joseph, <laughs> Joseph's in Egypt. Oh, don't we hope he's dead. <laughs> He ain't dead yet, folks, is yep. he? Yeah. So, Don and I watched the uh, Ten Commandments the other night. We, we filmed it, and we were watching it in segments. And when they were leaving uh, Egypt to go to the Promised Land, uh, they were showing Joseph's body being carried. That was, that was pretty cool, you know, now that we're studying Joseph. And they honored him that much, see, that they were taking him to the Promised Land and burying him him there. So uh, that's great, great honor. So, so he's saying to his sons, you know, you're sitting there looking at each other, <laughs> staring at each other, and you know, as a dads have some uh, discernment, don't they? And judge, uh, Jacob may have had the gift of spiritual discernment as well, the gift of God, and, and so I believe he's picking up on the fact that they're just sitting there nervous and on edge, and just staring at each other. What are we going to do now? We can't go to Egypt. We just can't go to Egypt. And, and so, so he, he gives them that push, doesn't he? In the following verses, he gets them out of the house and sends them on to Egypt. Verse 2, and he said, Indeed, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down to that place and buy for us there, that we may live and not die. So Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy grain in Egypt. But Jacob did not send Joseph's brother Benjamin with his brothers, for he said, lest some calamity befall him. See, Benjamin was the only child left that he and Rachel had together. So Benjamin was as special to Jacob as Joseph was. And made probably even more special now because that was the last one. That was his youngest. And you know how some people feel about their youngest child. So that was a very, very special child. And, and Rachel had already passed. And so 
he did not want to lose Benjamin the same way he lost Joseph. Now they had told, the brothers had told their dad that he, he got devoured by some wild beast when we weren't looking, you know. Um, all we found was, was, was some of his clothes and this and that and brought it back to Jacob. And, and Jacob had grieved horribly all those years believing the lie of those brothers. And uh, folks, <laughs> people reap what they sow, don't they? Yeah. It, it will come back to you. So that's why you got to believe that verse in the Bible that says your sin will find you out. So it's important to repent quickly of things like that. Okay, so verse 5. And the sons of Israel went to buy grain among those who journeyed, and the famine was in the land of Canaan. Now Joseph was governor over the land, and it was he who sold to all the people of the land. So, so Joseph was the one that was administrating all this uh, food that was to be given to the people from all over the territory, even the enemies of Egypt. And Joseph's brothers came and bowed down before him with their faces to the earth. Does that bring back any memory to you? Remember the dream that Joseph had that he told his dad and told his brothers, you know, that, that I had a dream that, that there were there was grain bowing down and, and then there's one grain and, and they and he, they're saying, are you saying that we're going to bow down to you one day? And so they were so angry because he had those dreams that uh, they would bow down to him. But here it is, right here, it's coming to pass. Uh, Genesis 42 and, and verse 6 is, is the verse where that actually happens for the first time. Verse 7, Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them. But he acted as a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them. So you, you, when I was younger and read this, I thought, well, how, why didn't they recognize their own brother? Well, first of all, it's been 20 years. So he's matured a lot since he was a teenager and they sold him into slavery like that at age 17. On top of that, he's wearing Egyptian makeup and his hair is all covered, you know. So he, he just looks really different from the way he used to look. You know, it's kind of like when... Dalton came in the church without a beard. I said, Who, who's this teenager coming to get our youth minister? So, yeah. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you, same with me. When I grew that, that white beard, I, I, to me, I looked like I was about 85. And I, was, I had to get rid of that quickly. Yeah. So when I get 85, I guess I grow back. So I look my age, right? So uh, they didn't recognize him. And uh, something else here to remember, too, is they might have recognized his voice, but he used an interpreter. Mm. So see, he spoke Hebrew, and he always used an Egyptian interpreter. So he would tell the interpreter, he'd probably whisper in his ear so they couldn't hear his voice, whisper in his ear what he wanted to, him to say to them, and, and so he would, the interpreter would speak for him. So they, they probably didn't look at his face very much at all. He probably hid his face quite a bit uh, so that they wouldn't recognize him. So, it goes, let's go ahead and read 7 again. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he acted as a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them. Hmm. Then he said to them, where do you come from? And they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food. So Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Verse 9. Then Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed about them and said to them, you are spies. <laughs> you have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said to him, no, my Lord. Notice they call him my Lord, he's saying. So back then that meant, master, I'll do whatever you want me to do. They said to him, no, my Lord, but your servants have come to buy food. So, <laughs> so, so now they're making themselves servants of, of uh, the Egyptians. See, they'll do anything to get that food and not to have to go into prison. They're, now they're scared to death. They're going to have to be, uh, go to prison for being called spies or known as spies. Verse 11, we are all one man's sons. We are honest men. <laughs> really? So, so maybe by that time they had repented and become honest men. Later they say that to their dad Jacob and he doesn't argue with them. So maybe, maybe they had repented by this time. We hope so. Your servants are not spies. Verse 12, but he said to them, no, but you have come to see the nakedness of the land. 
And they said, your servants are 12 brothers. They start repeating themselves, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And in fact, the youngest is with our father today, and one is no more. No, they don't say he's dead. So no more can mean he's no more with us. So they're being very vague about that. But Joseph said to them, it is as I spoke to you, saying you were spies. <laughs> so, so really, see, God gave him what to say. And besides getting food, they kind of are spies, you know. They're just, they're looking around all over Egypt trying to figure things out. And, and uh, so in a, in a way, that's like a spy, isn't it? Verse 15, in this manner you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh, you shall not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Yeah. So, so they knew, they knew they were in trouble now because they knew their daddy wouldn't give up Benjamin. And see, God gave Joseph that to say because he knew how much his daddy loved Benjamin. Mm -hmm. Send one of you and let him bring your brother and you shall be kept in prison that your words may be tested to see whether there is any truth in you or else by the life of Pharaoh surely you were spies. <laughs> Verse 17, so he put them all together in prison three days. So it could have been 30 years, but three days. Nothing compared to the two years that Joseph was in prison, right? But it may have been the exact same cell that he was in. And that's pretty symbolic of the three days in the tomb, isn't it? Very, very similar. It has, has some symbolic meaning there that, about grace, yeah. uh, about God's redemption. Because yes. uh, he could have he killed them and he, and. By God's grace living through him, by the Spirit of God, Yahweh, living through Joseph, he obeyed Yahweh and did not kill him, but had grace. Uh, and we're to have grace, aren't we? Verse 18, then Joseph said to them the third day, do this and live, for I fear God. So, so here is Joseph speaking through this interpreter again. And these brothers know that Everybody in Egypt worships many gods. And now this leader over them is saying that he lives for God and he knows Yahweh. And this must be a shock to them. Now, we're not told in the Bible that all of Egypt repented of worshiping many gods and worshiped the true God, Yahweh. But we do know that Pharaoh believed in God after Joseph interpreted his dreams. He believed in the true God, Yahweh. So it could be, and we don't know, but it could be that everybody or most everybody in Egypt now believed in the true God, Yahweh. Do this and live for I fear God, Yahweh God. Verse 19. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined to your prison, but you go and carry grain for the famine of your houses. And bring your youngest brother to me so that your words will be verified and you shall not die. They did so. Then they said to one another, we are truly guilty concerning our brother. For we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us and we would not hear. Therefore this distress has come upon us. Verse 21, they realized this is happening to us because of what we did to Joseph. God is finally punishing us for what we've done. It's coming on us now. So I can't help but wonder if, if Joseph may have intended to leave him in that prison longer and God spoke to him and said, don't do that. <laughs> and he says, okay, I fear you, Lord. I don't want to be punished by you like my brothers are going to be. So I, I'll do whatever you say, Yahweh. So so, but they know, they know that, that they're going to get punished here. Uh, verse 22, and Reuben answered, now remember who Reuben was? He was the oldest brother that said, you can't do this to Joseph. You're, you're not about, I'm not going to let you kill him. And then when he went away, they sold him into slavery. Mm -hmm. And so Joseph is saying, see what I told you idiots? <laughs> Why didn't you listen to me back then? Reuben answered him saying, Did I not speak to you saying, Do not sin against the boy? And you wouldn't listen? 
Therefore, behold, his blood is now required of us. So, so Reuben's wondering if they killed him in Egypt. And this is why they're being punished by God, because they killed him in Egypt. Verse 23, but they did not know that Joseph understood them, for he spoke to them through an interpreter. And look at 24, I love this. Joseph turned himself away from them and wept. Wow. That's his heart of love for his brothers. See? And he sees their repentance. And it really is probably tears of joy because he's excited how they're turning to Yahweh and sorry for what they've done. They, he can tell their hearts have been changed. He returned to them again and talked with them, and he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. Then Joseph gave a command to fill their sacks with grain, to restore every man's money to his sack, and to give them provision for the journey. Thus he did for them. Grace. He didn't have to do that. He could have made them fast on that journey, go through a little bit more misery. But not only did he give them the grain they wanted to take back so they could eat, but he also gave them their money back. And he also gave them silver to take with them as well. And it's real interesting how what happens uh, in the next chapter. We'll wait for that next time. That's the cliffhanger. Okay, <laughs> verse 26. So they loaded their donkeys with the grain and departed from there. But as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey feed at the encampment, he saw his money. There it was in the mouth of his sack. So he said to his brothers, my money has been restored. There it is in my sack. Look at that. Their hearts failed them. Now, I don't know what your version says there for failed them. But, but uh, I have a little note there Same. about verse 28. What now? Same. Yeah, their heart sank. Uh, that they they were. What that means is they were in, incredibly. They were severely fearful, anxious, and probably depressed. They were afraid, saying to one another, "What is this that God has done to us?" So they're thinking that God <laughs> put that in there, and really He did, didn't He? Through Joseph, yeah. through Joseph's servants that served him. So, uh, whatever we do for people, folks, that's why we need to say, hey, Jesus did it for you. Yeah. Whenever we're thanked for something, thank you for that. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for helping me out. We need to say, you're welcome, but praise Jesus. Right. Because he's the one that did it for you. Yeah. Verse 29. They went to Jacob, their father, in the land of Canaan, and told him all that had happened to them, saying, The man who was lord of the land spoke roughly to us, poor little babies, <laughs> and took us for spies of the country. But we said to him, We are honest men. We are not spies. We are twelve brothers, sons of our father. One is no more, and the youngest is with our father and this day in the land of Canaan. Then the man said, the Lord of the country, said to us, by this I will know that you're honest men. Leave one of your brothers here with me. Take food for the famine of your households and be gone. And bring your youngest brother to me so I may know that you are not spies, that you, that you are honest men. I will deliver your brother to you and you may trade in the land. Verse 35. Then it happened as they emptied their sacks that surprisingly, each man's bundle of money was in his sack. See, they had discovered that everybody had their money back yet until they got back with their dad. And when both they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. See, now Jacob's thinking that Simeon's been killed by the Egyptians. And you want to take Benjamin away? All these things are against me. Now, I want you to think about this too. You know, you, you, you stop right there and you think, what did Jacob do that he would suffer like that? Rewind. How he treated his brother. How he deceived his father. We all deserve whatever we get, folks. 
How can we say, oh, that's a godly, godly man. He shouldn't have to go through that. That woman, oh, she's got a good heart. She shouldn't have to go. Everybody deserves what they get in this life. Because we've all sinned. And you may think, well, look at this guy over here. He's just a, oh, whew, he's, he's a dark politician and he's living a rich, wealthy life. And, and look at this guy over here. He cheats everybody and he's living in this mansion and he never has any troubles. Folks, they live with a lack of peace in their heart. People who live a very sinful life, they don't have any ongoing joy. That's a gift of the Spirit. They don't have any assurance of heaven. They fear hell all the time. So they don't realize that if, they're, if they don't go through punishment on earth that they deserve, I guarantee you it's going to come in the next life. You see? Mm -hmm. Now, you may say, well, what, what if that sinful man is dying breath says, save me, Jesus? Yeah, he's saved, he goes to heaven, but at the beam of seat judgment, he's sure going to wish he hadn't done those things. That's part of that punishment. When it's all revealed, and we're all going to wish we've been more committed to God. We'll all wish that we had put the things of God above the things of the world yeah. more often. Yeah. We're going to wish we had talked to people about Jesus more than we talked about the cowboys <laughs> yeah. or, or the bears or whatever. You know. yeah. So yeah. we all deserve death and hell. You know, I remember when I was a kid and, and my preacher said, Folks, we all deserve death and hell. I was like, what do I do? You know? <laughs> I was about four or five years old. And I thought about it. Yeah, I disobeyed mom and dad quite a bit. Picked up my little brother. Yeah, probably, yeah, I get it. I get it. You know. <laughs> so yeah, we all do, don't we? We we all deserve death and hell. But praise God yes. that He came in Jesus yes, and paid the penalty in full for us. Praise God. Verse thirty-seven. Then Reuben spoke to his father, saying, "Kill my two sons if I do not bring him back to you. Put him back in my hands." And I will bring him back to you. So, so Reuben is acting like Superman here. You know, if, if if Benjamin gets killed by the Egyptians or wild animals or whatever, then kill my two sons. What? Well, that's a that's a nice daddy, isn't it? <laughs> sure, Grandpa's going to kill his two grandsons, right? Verse thirty-eight. But he said, "My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he is left alone." If any calamity should befall him along the way in which you should go, then you would bring down my gray hair with sorrow to the grave. In other words, I, that would kill me. That would just kill me if Benjamin was killed. So that's the only picture I can find really all over the internet of Joseph uh, having the interpreter there, see, uh, and, and his other servant with his brothers bowing down before him. That was a great picture, I thought. So write this down if you're taking notes. When sin has consequences, is the title of the message, and it's taken from Genesis 42. Write this down for number one. When sin has consequences, we must remember that pride can keep us from reaching out for help. The brothers of Joseph were not only fearful, but they were prideful and refused to go down to Egypt, they, they would have rather starved to death than to, than to take a chance on seeing Joseph again and Joseph paying him back. And doesn't that remind you of <coughs> Jacob being so fearful of meeting Esau? Very, very similar. See, it, it's, it's crazy how those generational sins pass down to the next generation. So when we have to suffer the consequences of our sin. Don't let pride <clears throat> keep you from reaching out for help. So many times Satan whispers in your ear and says, you don't want to tell anybody what you've done. You don't want that coming back on you. <clears throat> Excuse me. You, you don't want the Bible, God in his word commands that we confess our sins one to another. You know, some False religions say that you have to go through a priest or through a minister 
And that minister, only that minister can get you forgiveness from God. You have to tell that minister your sins so your, that minister can help you get forgiveness from God for those specific things. Wrong. Total mistranslation of those verses. But when, when the scriptures say confess your sins one to another, that's for reconciliation. So, so you can go to one, uh, the person you sinned against and say, hey, I was so wrong. I'm so sorry for what I did. And will you pray for me that, that I won't be that kind of person again? Uh, also, we need to remember that when we share with people that we can trust, what we're going through and what we've done. That's like counseling. Mm -hmm. we, we are opening up. We're bringing stuff from the darkness into the light, and that's healing. And so it's important that we get help. Yeah. And if you don't want to share with somebody in the church or your pastor, then it's important that you go to a, a conservative Christian counselor that's born again that can lead you in the ways of God. Yeah. Um, I've had church members come to me and pour their heart out about things, and then they're so embarrassed they will never return a phone call. That hasn't happened here, but it's happened to other churches. And so I'm very careful now about listening to what somebody wants to tell me if it's, if it's too deep and too dark. Um, and, and also I have a, and I encourage y'all to do this because all of you one day will, and I, I hope we'll have lots of members become lay counselors and, and even be trained with the training that I've gone through to help lay counselors. There's also a ministry called Stephen Steve. Ministry yeah. that, that trains you as well. And people, go, people have gone through that and been well trained mm -hmm. in Stephen Ministry. But, but it's a signed consent form that you give to somebody you counsel, even somebody in your family or a church member. And it says, if you tell me something that you've done that is against the law or has harmed you or harmed someone else, uh, I will have to report it. So that's something that, that they're made aware of. Uh, you also say, you know, I, I understand that so-and-so is not a licensed professional counselor, but they are uh, helping me to understand the ways of the Bible and God's will so that I can choose myself uh, how to solve my problems in my life. So it's very well laid out, and I encourage all Christian counselors, lay or full-time ministers that are ordained, to, to have that and, and use that because so many pastors and ministers have been sued by people mm -hmm. by saying, well, you didn't have any sign anything. You didn't tell me anything. You, I, I thought you were a licensed professional counselor. You led me in the wrong way. I'm suing you for everything you've got. So, I mean, pe Satan leads people like that to hurt and harm God's children. So, I encourage you to do that before you ever counsel someone that you really don't know that well. Or people you think you know well that, that might do that and surprise you as well. When sin has consequences, we must seek to comfort family and friends who suffer too. And we forget that our sin is passed down to the next generation and they suffer. We forget that what we do influences people around us who are our friends or even acquaintances and they suffer. I pastored a church one time, and I think I've told this before, but, but there are people here today and listening on uh, Facebook Live and YouTube that haven't heard this, but I, I pastored a church one time where I preached a sermon saying that it's not God's will for Christians to drink alcohol. It's a poor example for others. Um, and this church member almost every Sunday he came up to me after church and said uh, I firmly disagree with you pastor I, I think it's okay he says Jesus drank wine and I think it's perfectly okay uh, to drink like Jesus and the disciples as long as you don't get drunk I, the Bible only says don't get drunk and I said well I, said, I, I, I agree and disagree with you because those scriptures I, I showed you in the word of God 
says that Christians should live as a Christ-like example for others to follow. And so he disagreed and went his way. And then uh, his family went to visit family while he had to work and he stayed home. But he went out with the guys at work on a Friday night and uh, on a motorcycle and, and picked one of them up on his motorcycle, a young kid about 19, and uh, didn't realize he had drank too much when they went out that night, playing pool, drinking. And then uh, on the way back, the street it had, it had rained, the streets were wet. He turned his motorcycle, and the boy behind him didn't have a helmet on, and the boy behind him, his head went between the motorcycle and the bumper of a truck and crushed his skull. Well, he went to prison for many years, and I visited with him, and he said, uh, I wish I'd listened to you. If you ever want me to come and speak at your church, I will tell them, God spoke through you to warn me, and I didn't listen. And people need to listen and, and interpret Scripture the way you interpret Scripture. Uh, so we don't realize how our sin harms others. His, his family were just, oh, they were so grieved. They didn't have a daddy in their home for all those years. Uh, they had to live with their grandparents and and they were so in need financially as well. And, and I mean, it's a horrible thing uh, when, when sin comes down on your family, but it was so unintentional. But it's real, isn't it? So when sin has consequences, we must seek to comfort family and friends who suffer too. And not only comfort, but also, like I said earlier, tell them you're wrong, tell them you're sorry. Tell them that you want to make up for it. Tell them you want to make restitution with them. You want, to, you want to do things that make up for what you've done. Now, when you use the word restitution, you've got to be careful because some religions believe that you've got to do restitution for God to forgive you and let you in heaven. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about relationally with people. That, that you've got to make up for those days of misery that you cause for people. If you can, in some ways, that's why I say seek to comfort them. Number three, when sin has consequences, we must leave our comforts behind. So when you're suffering because of your sin, you have to give up things, don't you? The man in prison who got drunk and the boy behind him got killed because of his wreck and recklessness, he had to leave all his comforts behind when he went to prison. Whenever you're going through difficulty on this earth, you have to leave your comforts behind. And, and that needs to be something we think about before we say, oh, yeah, that sin will never hurt me. Just one more time. Number four, when sin has consequences, we must bow down to those we have sinned against. And you may think, well, I'm not going to bow down to anybody. But I want you to know what that word bow down means, the way I mean it. It means you've got to humble yourself. And you've got to come before them and tell them you were wrong and you're sorry. And you want to bless them. So that in itself is the same thing that Joseph's brothers had to do when they bowed down to him. They, they were in need. Uh, and we're in need. After we've sinned and consequences happen, uh, we owe it to those people to in a way, bow down to them and to be a blessing to them. And then number five, when sin has consequences, we must bow down to the Lord we have sinned against. And, and that's the main thing there, isn't it? That we bow down to Jesus. That we come before Him and say, God, I've sinned. God, I'm suffering the consequences of my sin. I know you love me, Lord. I know you've forgiven me already. I know by your blood you shed on the cross, my sins are forgiven and forgotten and separated. As far as the east is from the west, you can't, the Bible says you don't remember my sin anymore. But God, I know you know I'm suffering the consequences of what I've done. But Lord, I need your help. And he's always there to help, isn't he? He's, he's not an angry father, judge, that stands there with his arms crossed. And you're, you're getting exactly what you deserve, you little punk. 
but, but his arms are always out. His yes. hands are always open. And he says, come to me. Yeah. You know, remember, remember the one Jesus talked about, the man who beat his chest and said, oh God, I'm a sinner. I need you to save me. I need you to forgive me. And Jesus says, that's the one I listen to. Not those who think they don't need a Savior, but those who know yeah. they need a Savior. Yeah. So, even though sometimes our sin is great, and it harms a lot of people, and it causes a lot of people to sin, and we deserve for a millstone to be put on our neck and dropped in the depths of the sea is what we deserve, God says, there's always an open door. I'm, I preached about that this Sunday, so I won't say much about it now. But Jesus calls himself, what? The door, the gate. And, and it's, it, it always swings open to those who come to him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this message. We thank you, Lord, for once again reminding us of your great, great love for us and your great forgiveness. But God, help us remember this message that our sin will find us out. And the law of the harvest will come about. That we will reap what we've sown sooner or later. And God, sometimes when we repent and when we commit ourselves fully to you, I've seen so many who lived a horrible, horrible life. Even a hitman that became a born-again Christian didn't suffer on this earth like he deserved. And in, in eternity, he's welcomed into heaven and his sins are forgotten. But God, I, I pray that we would know that you always stand ready to forgive. The Father will run to us when we get out of the pig pen and we come home. So thank you, God, for having that kind of ongoing, unconditional love for us that always welcomes us when we come back in repentance and in faith. So, Lord, help us not only to live these words we've heard tonight and, and have this kind of forgiveness toward others and live as a Christ-like example for others, but, God, also I pray that we all would share this good news with others as well so they could be saved because so many think they've, they've gone too far. They've sinned too much. Help us to share that wonderful, good news, ask a sight of news that your love, your forgiveness is always available. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all so much for listening. May God bless you.